We're going to continue on now with the gross anatomy of the spinal cord. We're going to look at a cross section of the cord and identify where we have gray matter and white matter. I just want to point out here that there's a difference between the word matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, and the word mater, M-A-T-E-R. The names of the meningeal layers around the spinal cord and brain, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater are spelled M-A-T-E-R. Gray matter and white matter, those are different terms. So when we cut across the spinal cord, there really is a visible region in the center that looks a little bit like the wings of a bird or the wings of an angel. It's a different color. It's a darker color than the tissue that surrounds it. This is what we refer to as gray matter in the center and white matter around it. Notice that when you examine this cut surface, the spinal cord has mirror image symmetry. A lot of the human body has mirror image symmetry. So if we were to draw a line down the center of the cord here, we would see half on this side mirrored on this side. Now, the gray matter in the center of the cord is made out of neuron cell bodies and the dendrites that are extending off of the membrane. This is the central core of the spinal cord. We can describe regions in the gray matter. We can describe what are called the dorsal horns, the two thicker ventral horns, and in some regions of the spinal cord, although not visible in this picture, there's another horn of gray matter called the lateral horn. You only see the lateral horn in a section of the spinal cord that you might take between T2 and L1. The lateral horn only appears in that region because the lateral horn contains neuron cell bodies and dendrites of the sympathetic nervous system. So it's very regional in that one area of the cord. Throughout all of the spinal cord, you will find dorsal horns and ventral horns. Now, the reason that the center of the spinal cord, the gray matter, is a darker color than the rest of the spinal cord, the white matter, is because of pigment. This area is richer in melanin pigment and also in a pigment that is unique to the nervous tissue, which is called lipofuscin. Lipofuscin is produced and present in the cell bodies of neurons. That's why the cell bodies are going to look that darker gray color. Now, the rest of the material of the cord is white matter. These are the axons. And in the spinal cord, they are coated in myelin. Now, the right and left sides of the gray matter in the center of the spinal cord are connected to each other by a structure that's called the commissure. And in the center of that commissure, there is actually a hole, an opening, that creates a canal, very narrow canal, up and down the very center of the spinal cord. We call it the central canal. We said that cerebrospinal fluid travels in the subarachnoid space around the spinal cord. 
it can also circulate inside the very center of the spinal cord in that central canal. Now, inside that central canal, lining it, lining it, there are very specialized epithelial cells called ependymal cells. We're going to see these ependymal cells lining cavities in the brain as well. Remember, that's where we find epithelial cells. They not only cover the surface of the human body, but they also line hollow cavities inside the human body. Now, this central canal, this is not a critical structure for CSF circulation. In fact, in most adults, the central canal actually closes up in certain regions of the spinal cord. In addition to the commissure and the central canal, there are two other gross anatomical features of the spinal cord that we need to be familiar with. One is on the anterior surface or the ventral surface, and one is on the posterior or dorsal surface. When we look on the anterior surface, there is a groove, an actual split between the two halves of the spinal cord that's called the anterior median fissure. There's also a split on the posterior side between the left and right halves, but this one is much more narrow, and this one is called the posterior median sulcus. You can see those structures on this drawing. So let's orient ourselves. We're looking at a, the spinal cord in cross section, and we're looking at the cut surface. We can see a pair of spinal nerves emerging from this cord. We'll talk about the anatomy of the spinal nerves in a couple of minutes, so we're gonna ignore a lot of the labeled terms on the slide. In the center of the spinal cord, we can see this darker region that's labeled gray matter. This is where the cell bodies and the dendrites emerging off of those cell bodies, this is where those are all located. They contain melanin and lipofusion, and so they just are this darker color. Outside of the gray matter, there's white matter, and that white matter is composed of all the axons myelinated axons that are coming off of those neurons. Inside the gray matter, we can see dorsal horns that are a little narrower. We can see ventral horns. Those are a little wider. And we have a commissure that connects the two sides. In the very center of the commissure, there's a hole. And that hole creates a canal up and down the length of the spinal column where cerebrospinal fluid can circulate. Remember, this spinal cord, as it sits in the human body, the person would be looking this way. Their eyes would be faced this way. This is the anterior surface of the body. This is the posterior surface. This is where the person's back would be. So there is a groove between the left and, and right halves of the spinal cord here, and it's called the anterior median fissure. It's got a, a space in it the way it's drawn, but you don't necessarily see much of a big space in an actual spinal, car, spinal cord. Over on the other side, Instead of seeing that groove with a space in it, all we have is literally just a split here. That split is called the posterior median sulcus. We're going to leave the gross anatomy of the spinal cord now, and we're going to think about the microscopic anatomy of the cord. We're going to introduce a lot of new terminology here. When we think about the cord in microscopic terms, we can also start to use language that describes both structural regions of the cord, 
and also functional regions of the cord. Remember, the spinal cord has this paired mirror symmetry. The white matter surrounds the gray matter, and we know that the white matter contains axons. The way the axons are organized in the white matter can come in two forms. We can talk about a structural organization of those axons, and we can also talk about a functional organization of those axons. What kind of impulses are those axons transmitting? So if we start with the structural language, bundles of axons that go up and down the length of the spinal cord exist in three structural regions, and these are called funiculi. Funiculi. The singular term is funiculus. So there are posterior funiculi. Remember, they're always paired. There's always one on the left and one on the right. There are anterior funiculi, and there are lateral funiculi. Inside each funic funiculi, or I should say inside each funiculus, the axons are bundled into smaller organizational units called fascicles. You've seen this term before. Remember, we talked about fascicles existing in muscle, and we talked about fascicles in the nerves, in the peripheral nervous system. Fascicles are essentially bundles within a bundle. So inside the spinal cord, these fascicles are bundles within a funiculus. So here's that cross-sectional view again of the spinal cord. Let's orient ourselves. Here's the gray matter in yellow, dorsal horns, ventral horns. Here's the commissure. You can just see the central canal in the center of the commissure. Here's the anterior median fissure. Here's the posterior, this line, posterior median sulcus. Now, look at the white matter surrounding the gray matter. This is the posterior region, and we have left and right posterior funiculi here. Here are the anterior left and right funiculi. And here are the lateral funiculi. Within each pair of funiculi, there are fascicles of axons bundled up. Now, we can also talk about white matter in terms of functional units. And frankly, most of what we'll talk about is these functional units. Now, we talked about how axons can be bundled together in the peripheral nervous system into what we call nerves. In the central nervous system, in the spinal cord, we don't use that term, but we're essentially talking about the same thing. It's a bundle of axons that are going to function together as a unit, but instead of calling it a nerve, we're going to call it a tract. Now, the way these tracts sit in the white matter is there are ascending tracks and there are descending tracks. Think of ascending as heading towards the brain, descending as coming out from the brain. The ascending tracks got, get their name because functionally these are tracks containing axons that are transmitting sensory information. The descending tracks get their name because these are tracks that contain axons transmitting motor information. Now, all of the bundled axons that are sitting in a particular tract are functionally together. They come from the same origin. They have the same destination in the central nervous system. And they are 
contributing to the same function, either sensory or motor. Now here's one of the perhaps strangest features of the spinal cord. Several of these tracks, these either ascending or descending tracks, undergo what we call decussation. Decussation is simply crossing over from one side of the spinal cord to the other, from that left to that right half of the spinal cord. It's a weird thing, and I can't tell you exactly why it happens, but we see this up in the brain too in a couple of, um, in a couple of examples. Now, the reason I mentioned decussation is that there are some terms that you will read about in source materials that re refer to this phenomenon, this crossing over. And these are the terms ipsilateral and contralateral. The word ipsilateral means same side. Contralateral means opposite side. On this slide, we're looking at a drawing of a little block of the spinal cord. The area where the gray matter is, is actually sort of elevated up so that we can see it. So here's gray matter. You can see that the spinal nerves are coming off. There's a, a spinal nerve being created on this side. There's a spinal nerve being created on this side. Don't worry about that just yet. The white matter surrounds the gray matter. We might be talking about the posterior and the anterior and the lateral funiculi if we wanted to talk structure, but instead we're going to talk about function here. And what they've drawn in for us is the fact that in this white matter, some of these axons, which remember are traveling up and down the length of the spinal cord, some of them could be called functionally descending because they're coming from the brain down the length of the spinal column. Um, others could be described as being ascending because the axons are traveling up the length of the spinal cord towards the brain. Ascending and descending tracts of axons. Now, they've drawn two here for ease of visualization. But of course, there are many tracts. There are many, many tracts. There are many bundles of axons in the spinal cord that function together because they're carrying similar types of information from a similar origin along a similar pathway to their destination. In the drawing, they're actually showing um, a human hand out here in the periphery and this person is getting ready to touch something that's quite sharp. That information is going to be relayed along this red pathway. They're showing us this peripheral nerve pathway, this bundle of axons that's going to carry this information into the spinal cord, and it's going to actually go up these ascending tracks towards the brain so that, again, this information can be interpreted, it can be integrated and interpreted, and a response can be made. That response is going to come down the descending tract, and at the appropriate level of the spinal cord, it's going to be sent out through a spinal nerve, and then into a peripheral nerve, down to its destination, down to the effector cells that are going to respond, that are going to help move this finger away from this sharp object. Now, we can also make some connections between those structural funiculi and the functional tracts. The sensory, sensory tracts are found in all three of those structural locations. So you'll find ascending tracks in the posterior funiculi, in the anterior funiculi, and in the lateral funiculi, all three. But when it comes to the motor, the descending tracks in the spinal cord, you only find them in two, 
the anterior and the lateral. There are no descending tracts in the posterior funiculi. On this slide, you can see that point in a drawing. Again, we're looking at a cross section of the spinal cord here. Off to the side, we can see a spinal nerve emerging. Again, we'll talk about spinal nerves in just a minute. Here's the pair on the other side, the paired nerve. Here's the cord itself. We can see gray matter drawn in brown in the center. The white matter is everything sitting outside of that. And of course, it's multicolored in this image. We can just see the central canal. That's sitting in the commissure. We've got a dorsal horn here, a dorsal horn, a ventral horn, a ventral horn. Nerve cell bodies and their dendrites are in this gray matter. Everything outside of the gray matter is white matter, myelinated axons. We've got a posterior funiculus, a pair of them. We've got anterior funiculi, and we've got lateral funiculi. Those are structural regions. And then when it comes to functional regions, we can start talking about ascending and descending tracts. The ascending tracts, which are carrying sensory information up towards the brain, those are drawn in this blue color. You can see that there are ascending blue regions in the posterior funiculi, in the anterior funiculi, and in the lateral funiculi. You can see that there are descending motor tracts in, and those are shown in red, in the lateral funiculi and in the anterior funiculi, but none in the posterior. Look at the names of these tracts. There isn't one ascending tract in the posterior funiculi. There are many of them. Each tract is a bundle of axons that functions like a nerve does in the peripheral nervous system. They come from the same spot, the same origin. They're carrying the same kind of information, sensory information. They have the same destination in the central nervous system. Each one of these is a tract. Over here on the descending tract side, there are many individual descending tracts. They're all containing a bundle of axons that work together. They function together. They have a same, the similar origin, they have a similar destination, and they're carrying motor, motor impulses. Let's talk for a minute about these ascending tracts. If you were to go inside of one ascending tract and you were to tease out from that bundle of axons, if you were to tease out one, one pathway from the origin up into the central nervous system to its destination, that one string that you would pull out of that ascending tract would be made out of up to three individual neurons. So these sensory signals that are being sent up into the central nervous system, they originate somewhere in the body. They travel from the periphery into the central nervous system, into the cord and upwards towards the brain. From that outside origin, from that peripheral origin, to that spot where they land in the spinal cord or the brain. There are three neurons involved. That's it. Remember we said axons can be very long on neurons, and this is a great example of that. Those three neurons just get very generally referred to as first order, second order, or third order neurons. Now, I also have a second set of terms, the primary neuron, the secondary neuron, the tertiary neuron. I put both types of terms in here because in my experience, you will read both types of terms just as often, depending on the source you're reading. So 
primary, secondary, tertiary. This is the same kind of language that you hear again and again in biology. We talk about different levels of organization of proteins using these types of terms. Primary, again, just means first order, the simplest, the basic. Um, in the case of an ascending tract, we're talking about the first, the primary neuron. This would be the neuron that's out in the peripheral part of the body that is detecting the stimulus. So somewhere in the body, this primary neuron is the neuron that's picking up the original information. So it's going to travel from wherever that receptor is. That's where the dendrite is going to pick up the information. And then it's going to travel into the spinal cord or the brain. Think about that. Think about how far of a distance that might be from a receptor out in the body all the way to the spinal cord or sometimes even to the brain. That neuron would have a very long axon. That's what we call the primary neuron in an ascending tract. The secondary neuron is going to be an interneuron. Remember, what an interneuron does is just connect two other cells. <laughs> now, this interneuron is going to receive the signal from that primary neuron, and it's going to carry that signal and transmit it on to the tertiary neuron, the third order neuron. The tertiary neuron is also an interneuron. That's important to remember. And it's going to be picking up the signal from the secondary neuron and transmitting it somewhere up into the brain in the cerebrum. Remember, this is just one string inside that ascending tract that we've described. And of course, there are many, many strings in that tract. The other thing to know is that I said that ascending tracts, each string inside the ascending tract can have up to three neurons. It turns out that there are some ascending tracts that contain these individual strings that are made out of only two neurons, just a primary neuron and a secondary neuron. Just be aware of that fact. This is a drawing that represents one neuronal string inside an ascending tract. They've drawn this to show both the peripheral and the central nervous systems. In yellow, we are out in the peripheral nervous system. In this brownish orange color, we're in the central nervous system. So somewhere out in this, bo out in this body, a stimulus is being received and it's being received by receptors on the branches of this neuron. This happens to be what we would call a first order or a primary neuron. Look at how they've drawn this neuron. Here's the cell body. This is one of those pseudo unipolar neurons. It has one branch coming off of the cell body, but then that one branch immediately becomes two. On one side are what function as dendrites, and on the other side are what function as terminal branches. So the signal is received, and it is transmitted to the nerve cell body dendrites of the second order neuron, or the um, secondary neuron. Notice that while we're out in the peripheral nervous system here with this first order or primary neuron, once we have the connection, the synapse between the primary and secondary, now we're in the central nervous system. We might be in the spinal cord or we might be up in the brainstem, but we're in the central nervous system. The second order or secondary neuron is then going to synapse with the next one, which is third order or tertiary. Again, this is up inside the brain, but it, what's most important to remember is that it's central nervous system.
that third order neuron is carrying that information to the ultimate destination cell, which is up in the cortex. On this slide, we're looking at the exact same information, just drawn a little differently. I like this drawing because it clearly shows us where the brain is involved here, both the upper parts of the brain and the brain stem here. And then they're also showing us spinal cord involvement here and what's out in the peripheral nervous system. Now, they brought some terminology in on this slide, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but we will talk about in a later lecture. There are different types of sensory receptors in the body. They've got two of them listed here. They have mechanoreceptor and proprioceptor. We're going to talk about different types of sensory receptors again, but just in a later lecture. For now, understand that these sensory receptors are in the periphery. They're out in the peripheral parts of the body. They are being picked up. This information is being picked up by the primary neuron or the first order neuron. And that information is being sent out along the axons of that first order neuron up into the central nervous system. And that's what you can see here. From the spinal cord, we're traveling up, up, up into the brain stem here. We're traveling up, up, up into the brain itself here. We have three or up to three neurons involved. So the two places that we need to see are where the primary synapses with the secondary and where the secondary synapses with the tertiary. The primary is going to synapse with the secondary neuron in either the spinal cord or in the brainstem. And they're showing it a synapse right here for us in the brainstem. So the primary neuron is synapsing with the secondary neuron cell body right here. Now, that secondary neuron is sending its axon from the brainstem up into the brain. Here's our next synapse right here between the secondary neuron and the nerve cell body of the tertiary neuron. And then that tertiary neuron will synapse with a cell up in the cortex, the cerebral cortex of the brain. Three neurons involved in these ascending tracks. Now, when we look into the descending tracks, if we were to pull one string of neurons out of a descending tract, it would look different. Instead of having three neurons, typically, instead we're only going to see two. Now, the descending tracts, remember, are carrying motor signals. And these two neurons that are in charge of carrying and transmitting those signals are called upper motor and lower motor. So we're traveling from the central nervous system out into some effector cell in the body along an upper motor neuron, which then synapses with a lower motor neuron, which then synapses with an effector cell. Now, the upper motor neuron can either begin with its nerve cell body in either the cerebral cortex or the brainstem, you know, somewhere in the brain. And it's going to synapse with a lower motor neuron either in the brainstem or in the spinal cord. Now, the lower motor neuron is going to travel out and terminate on some kind of an effector cell. Remember, that's typically a muscle, a muscle fiber, or a gland. Here's a drawing of a single string of neurons out of a descending tract. Now, they don't draw the brain and the spinal cord and the brain stem separately here. 
they've got the brain indicated just as this bar, and this is particularly the um, cerebral cortex. Then they have the brain stem below that indicated as this bar. And then they've got the spinal cord here. So in this drawing, we're looking at a nerve cell body up here in the upper parts of the brain in the cerebral cortex. And you can see that there are two possible pathways for this upper motor neuron. It can either travel to the brain stem and synapse with a lower motor neuron, or it can travel all the way into the cord somewhere and synapse with a lower motor neuron. In both cases, the lower motor neuron is traveling, sending impulses out into the periphery where it will synapse with an effector cell and cause some kind of motor response. Here's another drawing of the exact same thing. Here's the brain. Here's the brain stem. Here's the spinal cord. Here's the periphery. We're talking about descending tracks here. These are motor tracks. This is information in the form of electrical signals that's being sent out to have some effect because of some sensory information that's been received. The upper motor neuron has its nerve cell body either in the upper portions of the brain, the cortex of the brain, or in the brain stem. Now, if we follow the one that's the nerve cell body, this upper motor neuron that's up in the cortex, the axon is going to travel all the way down, down, down into the spinal cord. Here we see the lower motor neuron, nerve cell body. It's receiving information from the upper motor neuron. It's sending its axon out into the periphery. It's going to synapse with an effector cell, and we're going to see an effect. In this particular diagram, the effector is that sheet of muscle that we've talked about that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity, the diaphragm. So this particular motor pathway represents a somatic pathway that will impact respiration. Remember, somatic should make you think voluntary or aware. You know at times you are aware of the fact that you want to take a deep breath, so you take a deep breath. This is the type of motor pathway that we're talking about. The other pathway that you can see in this drawing, which happens to have the upper motor neuron nerve cell body in the brain stem instead of the cortex, and is sending its axon down this dotted line to the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord and then out to the effector diaphragm. This represents not a somatic pathway, but an autonomic pathway, an involuntary pathway. Respiration is a complex process in the human body. And it's under both voluntary or somatic control and involuntary or autonomic control.